so the last talk for today, Professor uh, Brigitte Foster uh, from the University of Passau uh, with the talk Reflecting Frames and Bases. Please, for please. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction and also thank you for the invitation. I've been to Cambridge several times, but this is the first time at the uh, Newton Institute and I enjoy it a lot. Thank you for setting up this nice and varied conference here. Yeah, if you're Googling rebricking, you probably won't find a lot on this because it's a term that we coined to be able to speak about a phenomenon that we've observed in signal and image processing. Rebricking, you can think about taking two real bases, putting one in the real part, putting the other one in the imaginary part, doing a recombination, and then thinking about what does it give? Does this give something reasonable? The idea here, in fact, goes back to a quite old paper from Gabor, who uh, coined the term of the complex signal, or later it was called the analytic signal, where he did exactly this, putting signal in the real part and the transformed signal in the imaginary part. Yeah, this has certain properties, the convenient ones, and some which one takes, has to take care of. And uh, yeah, but the idea has been embra embraced for um, several algorithms. So what we are looking here now is uh, the properties, when can we do this sort of, of rebricking, of putting a real basis in the real part and the real basis uh, then with an eye in the imaginary part to construct real spaces and orthonormal bases. When do we get parsable frames and what happens if we add additional structure, for example, wavelet properties. And I'll close with some examples. So the original idea that Gabor bothered was the following. If we start with a real-valued function or with a real-valued signal from some measurements, and we look at the Fourier spectrum, <coughs> spectrum is the absolute value of the Fourier transform, then it's always um, an, an even Fourier spectrum. Because the even part of the signal gives an even real Fourier transform, and the odd part gives an imaginary odd, and hence we get, where is, sorry, this goes back here, there's the laser pointer here, then this gives a um, symmetric spectrum. Hence, from an um, uh, yeah, engineering point of view, you cannot analyze single-sided frequency bands with real bases. And this was the starting point from a nice paper from uh, Denis Gabor in 1946 in theory of um, communications where he introduced the, the complex signal. And what he did was taking the signal that he measured in the real part and putting something in the imaginary part. Here the J indicates, as Gabor was an engineer, the imaginary part. And he tries hard to convince his peers. He indeed gives five reasons why looking at such a construct is interesting. First one, he says, in order to apply the simple and elegant formalism of quantum mechanics, he wants to take them over for signal processing and for an interpretation of Heisenberg's uncertainty relation in communication theory. So he tries to convince with prose. And um, then he says, from a geometric point of view, how to see signals as taking as the original measured signal and sigma then, in the imaginary part, the signal in quadrature to S, something that we now well know and well remember from wavelet theory. But his idea was to transform the oscillating into a rotating vector. If you look at that paper, then you, you see that um, it's uh, the, the signals are designed by, by hands on a circle. At the third point, he then gives the recipe, the recipe that we just saw on the previous slide, namely um, we suppress the amplitude belonging to the negative frequencies because they are double due to the symmetric spectrum, 
and um, yeah, multiplying the amplitudes of the positive frequency by two. This is just what one does with a projection in the Fourier domain. And then he gives a mathematical approach, saying what should one put in the imaginary part, namely the Hilbert transform. Hilbert transform here is a principal value, taking the signal in this integral with a kernel shifted by t. And as a last argument, he even puts a um, machine, how one could calculate this complex signal. And I think this is really beautiful. He says one puts uh, the signal on the lamp, then this is, sh uh, this is shine on a rotating um, cylinder, which is coated by some fluorescent um, uh, material. And then with this rotation, the signal is again taken here in the shift because rotating makes a time shift here by this photo cell. And on some parts, this um, is uh, transparent. And then you see here this one over T cutout, which gives exactly the, the kernel of the Hilbert transform. And then here inside, you can measure the Hilbert transform of that signal. So this is his idea, and uh, Gabo thought it's so important that he even thought about producing an, a building, constructing an electromagnetical device to generate this complex signal. Bill then, two years later, took this idea and called it the signal analytique, so the analytic signal, and this is the term which we are still referring to today. Although, by this construction, we don't get a really analytic signal in or analytic function in the sense of complex analysis. It's just the limit of a function which is uh, analytic in the upper or the lower half plane, and we have a non-tangential limit. Anyway, this notion stuck. And it has been around since then in signal and image processing and uh, came up yeah, in the years 2000 again, around 2000, with the complex dual tree wavelet transform, where the idea of the analytic signal was combined with wavelet analysis. And uh, yeah, it was Kingsbury's nice idea, who is also located here in, in Cambridge, by um, taking a wavelet transform and a half shift of a wavelet transform, which is an approximate Hilbert transform pair then, and doing the analysis. And this is very stable, much more stable than um, classical DBT, because it has a redundancy, and therefore people have embraced this idea. Also during that time, there came the idea of taking um, multidimensional signals by not only adding an imaginary part, or one imaginary part, but adding several imaginary parts, for example, putting in other transforms and then mapping on a quaternionic vector space. So we could put the Hilbert transform in the first complex variable and other transforms in the others. And as um, Clifford analysis was more and more uh, going into mathematical physics and also into mathematical optics, more and more of these methods were developed. For example, uh, yeah, by Felsberg and Sommer, and then there were also Ries wavelets by the group of UNSA and also uh, from, from my team here. So this, this idea is around. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as these techniques are available, of course, people have the idea, oh, um, if I just have to stuck in uh, wavelets and then I just do it with my basis and do these transforms and do signal analysis with this. And from a mechanical, mathematically mechanical point of view, yeah, these analysis do work. But if we want to reconstruct the signal, then there are certain conditions which are put on the basis that are included into all these real and imaginary parts. But um, this is not really considered, and it often just appears 
when the reconstruction fails in algorithms when there appear certain um, yeah, failures or errors in the reconstructed image and one wonders, oh, there's something wrong in, in the algorithm. So what one can always do uh, refer as a signal as a or function in some Hilbert space. Then what we can do with all these methods and also by, by using other uh, transforms is doing an, an analysis and then ending up with coefficients. Nice so far, but usually for signal analysis we need to have an inverse transform if we want to do any reconstruction from coefficients back to an enhanced signal. And in particular, if we are working with uh, some filters on the coefficients, get new coefficients, and hopefully enhanced signal, then it's crucial that the inverse transform work. Hence, we cannot plug in all sorts of functions into such a construction basis plus I some other basis. So I put this um, to the simple questions because the, they all fit to the problems of these three applications that I, that I showed you um, on the complex dual tree transform on uh, Felsberg and Sommer um, monogenic function and also on these Ries wavelets. These methods work if you put in other, other bases, but uh, the question is on the reconstruction. So the question is, if we have real bases in a Hilbert space, some real Hilbert space and two real bases, can they be recombined to a complex basis in this way, Fn plus Ign? So I put one of the bases in the real part and the other one in the imaginary part. For which bounded real operators is a family Fn plus I AFn a basis? From a GABA point of view, the Hilbert transform should do, right? And how about real spaces? How about orthonormal basis frames, possible frames? And to give this uh, a name to refer to, we call this approach rebricking. So this is the setting. We are starting with a separable Hilbert space over the reals. And we want to complexify then H plus I, H is the corresponding complex Hilbert space, obviously. Let's think how frames and bases are generated. If we start from an orthonormal basis, then applying a topological isomorphism to it gives all these bases. If we apply unitary operator, then we get another orthonormal basis again. And if we use a bounded subjective linear operator or one with a dense range, then we end up with a frame. And for one three spaces of frame or orthonormal basis, the situation is clear. If we have a real valued three spaces for the real valued space, then it's also a real valued basis for the complex space. So this means that from the previous slide, the operator A could be zero. That would be a, a, an invalid operator here, but it's obviously not interesting. So here's the um, proper notion of what we call by rebricking or rebrickable. We have two real re-spaces and we put them together in this way, Fn plus Ign as a new set. <coughs> and 
they are called replicable if the result is again three spaces for the complex space. And we call A a rebricking operator for three spaces if this family is a complex three spaces for every choice of Fn that I put in there, not for a specific basis, but for every basis. Okay, here again we can see if A is equal to zero, that was the previous lemma, everything's fine. Identity, same thing. Is there more? One can look at it quite simply by, um, yeah, from, from an operator theoretic point of view. And this is where I started collaborating with uh, Thomas Fink, and Florian Heinrich, and Moritz Bröll from uh, my institution. Um, and uh, yeah, meanwhile, one of them is in industry, but uh, this makes it even more interesting for signal analysis here. Let's look at a topological isomorphism. And we want to know when is it a rebricking operator in the sense that uh, the operator A produces in this way a complex respaces for every real respaces. And in fact, if we can prove it that it's already true for one, then it's true for all. Because it depends on the spectrum, I should not be an um, element of the spectrum, it should be a resolvent set, and equivalently minus i should be in the resolvent set of uh, the adjoint. So we are trying, hence, to avoid i as eigenvalue. When we are looking at respaces, usually for the analysis, one needs to take a different function family than for the synthesis. And we are again here in, in this problem over here, that the transforming family is a different one from the synthesis family. And the question is, um, how about the, the families then when we do rebricking? So let's have a family and its dual family uh, as a pair of respaces. We suppose that A is a rebricking operator. And B is the operator that we apply to the respaces by identity plus IA. Then the rebricked basis is a respaces. That's because A is a rebricking operator by definition. And it has a dual respaces, which we also get by um, the adjoint inverse of the adjoint applied to the dual respaces. Hence, we have reconstruction with the dual, and here we can apply this operator. But in general, it does not have the same structure as uh, B by being identity plus I. So this we cannot expect. How about orthonormal bases? Well, they have length one, so we have to normalize. This is what is done here with this one over square root of two, or you can also normalize by taking cosine in the real part and sine in the imaginary part. Um, this both works. And then A has to be self-adjoined and unitary. Then we have a rebricking operation. And the proof here is simple by what we need for a respaces to be mapped on a respaces is, uh, for an orthonormal basis to be mapped on an orthonormal basis, we need that the mapping is unitary and then everything falls out. That's a simple exercise. We know from the Fourier basis, I mean, this is the basis which has a certain real valued representation and the complex exponential representation. Do they fall into this bricking concept? Yes, they do. So let's look at L2 over the circle with values in R, so real valued functions. With a classical product, 
and I skipped the absolute value, uh, uh, the, the, the complex conjugate here because we have real valued functions. Okay, then we can have a basis of constant function and cosine and sine terms, and then we need to get the frequencies higher and higher. Now what do we use for rebricking, that it works out nicely to have complex exponentials? Um, we mm -hmm. use the same basis, but we just interchange these pairs, cosine and sine pairs. And then when doing the rebricking, we get a constant and the respective exponentials, just as expected. Another example. How about rebricking orthonormal basis of shifts in the space L2 of Z? So we consider an orthonormal basis coming from an element X, which is a real vector, and we want to shift it by the right shift operator here, and want to have that all these shifted versions form an orthonormal basis. The simplest would be the canonical basis, right? Now, if we want to rebrick for orthonormal basis, then we require the operator to be unitary and self-adjoint. That was the previous theory. But now we have an additional structure <coughs> here. It's shift invariant. And hence, we have an additional property here we want that the operator A um, intertwines with, with shifts, with T. This gives us an additional structure. Now we can think of the Fourier transform. If we have a bounded linear shift invariant operator, then it has convolution structure. And the Fourier transform has a nice property of mapping convolutions to multiplications. Hence, our bricking operator must have the property that uh, if it's applied to x, then we take the inverse Fourier transform. I denoted this here with a, with a wedge. Then we have a multiplier in Fourier domain and then apply the Fourier transform. How should then this corresponding multiplier bounded function look like? Well, we have the properties from the rebricking operator and we have the property from this shift invariance. A is self-adjoint, so the multiplier must be real valued. A is unitary, therefore the operator, uh, the multiplier M must have value one and the absolute value almost everywhere. And uh, yeah, the operator A should map real sequences to real sequences, and M must be even. And so M can only take values in minus one and plus one. So, and this is what the operator then looks like in Fourier domain we add as we have yeah, identity plus IA here in Fourier domain, the multiplier gets 1 plus IM. Now, how about the Hilbert transform? That was the original idea of Gabor to use that as an operator in the imaginary part. The Hilbert transform certainly is an isometric isomorphism, so it would fit but it has a certain inversion property, namely if we apply the Hilbert transform twice to a function in L2R, then it's minus F. So applying the Hilbert transform twice gives minus the identity. And this means that H, the Hilbert transform, has the wrong eigenvalues, namely plus minus one. So unfortunately, the Hilbert transform as originally thought for is not uh, uh, suitable for a rebricking operator. And yeah, we can see that indeed, if we would do the rebricking, then we would end up with a non trivial kernel because if we apply identity plus IH to here, 
the identity minus i h applied to some basis element, then we end up in, in zero. So we have a non-trivial kernel here. Aha, uh -huh. and now what's with uh, the, the complex dual tree wavelet transform? There we used wavelets, yeah, real part plus approximate the red transform. If you look in the techniques of uh, Kingsbury, he produces the filters respectively for the discrete transform where you have approximate Hilbert transform pairs because otherwise there would be this kernel and you wouldn't have perfect reconstruction. But of course it's a question, um, if it's approximate Hilbert transform pairs, uh, what does it mean approximate? Um, how close can we approximate? What what, what uh, sort of norms should we use here? These are open questions which should still be considered. Switching to frames, leaving the basis. We use the same notion. We take frames in the real valued Hilbert space and call them rebrickable if the sum fn plus ign again is a frame in the complex Hilbert space. And accordingly, the rebricking operator is defined in a similar way. There we also have to deal with eigenvalues to characterize the respective rebricking operators. However, we cannot work with the spectrum alone, but we need the approximate eigenvalues. What's that? Lambda is an approximate eigenvalue if there is a sequence of normed elements Fn such that they converge, uh, such that lambda Fn converges to AFn in, in norm. This is called approximate point spectrum. And from this, we get a characterization for the frame rebricking. For all frames, the family Fn plus IFn is a frame, again, for all frames, if identity plus Ia is subjective and if minus A is not in the approximate point spectrum of the adjoint. So also here for the frames, we have a criterion with regard to spectral properties for a breaking operation. How about possible frames? They should be normed. We want to have that uh, the frame <coughs> bounds are equal to one. Let's start with an orthonormal basis in a separable Hilbert space. And we want to have an operator U bounded such that UEN is a possible frame. And then we can calculate. F then as it's a possible frame, we have frame bounds one, so we have here an equality on the coefficients. And we can put the edge line to the other side and immediately see, as En was an orthonormal basis, that in this case, u star needs to be an isometry. Hence, the possible frames are precisely the families u, e, n, where we have an isometry. For rebricking, this means if we are starting with a possible frame, then the rebricked version is a possible frame too if A is unitary and self adjoint, because then we already have that A star is the required isometry for possible frame rebricking. How about in finite dimensional spaces? I mean, in, in this case, we could use any sets, but they should have, they should lie in the same space, in the same dimension. And yeah, for a breaking, we require them to, that the um, families have the same length. This means that we can put them into the columns of certain matrices, and if we're doing um, basis rebricking, then the, um, uh, the, the matrices in these columns 
they will become inverted. So we have we start with two real invertible matrices, and then we can translate the properties of the rubricking from a Hilbert transform space in the following. These um, matrices added with one in the real and the other in the imaginary part is again invertible, but now in the complex field. Or V2, V1 inverse has no eigenvalue i, and then this is the rubricking operator. Does this always work? But there's a simple example that um, this does not work for all bases putting together in the real uh, space. Because let's look at this matrix, obviously invertible, two bases in, in the columns, same thing here. But if we do the rubricking, then this is not a full rank. Multiply with i. However, if I would do a permutation of the second matrix, then the rubricking would work because then this matrix here has full rank. Now, does this always exist such a permutation that we can do rubricking in the finite dimensional space? What one can show is, let's assume we have a real valued matrix and we suppose that uh, lambda naught then is an eigenvalue of A and all of the permuted columns, column matrices. And in this case, only two possible eigenvalues are there. Namely, it could be that lambda naught is zero, then we don't have full rank. Or it's this eigenvalue here, which certainly is real, because all the, the A is a real valued matrix, so all the ALMs are real valued, and there is no other. That's not constructive, but it shows that there exists a permutation such that rebricking is possible in the real valued spaces. Let's put more structure. How about wavelets? If we put a wavelet basis in the real part and a wavelet basis in the imaginary part, can we do a rebricking such that the wavelet properties of translations and dilations of a single function still work? So we call this rebricking of orthonormal wavelet bases if two bases, two wavelet bases can be rebricked in this way or with an appropriate operator A. But what does A need to be? Well, for Orthonormal bases, we know unitarity and self adjoinder that comes from the previous theorem, but now we impose this additional structure of the wavelets, which means that the operator A needs to commute not only with translations, but with dilations also. So we require, in a sense, that these bases uh, involved are indexed consistently. You can think of uh, thinking um, as A of a reflection, which would give a basis, but uh, then you would have the reflected wavelet basis for, from uh, regarding the translation, it would be indexed in the reverse way. So this does not completely fit this theory here. Okay. Then again, thinking of Fourier transforms, if we have a translation invariant system, then we can write it as a multiplication in Fourier domain. And the multiplier here is this bounded function m, which again is a real valued multiplier. And as in the previous case with the um, uh, sequence spaces, we end up with that m should be valued, taking values only in plus minus, should be symmetric. And now this comes from this dilation invariance, should be self-similar with regard to uh, the powers of uh, two to the powers of j. But there are such functions then. And yeah, this is an example of such a multiplier that one could use for the, to realize a rebreaking operator or anything which um, has the requirements from the previous slide.
Of course, what we have here then um, is we don't induce continuity on frequency domain side, which means that we cannot expect decay in time domain from this. But um, it works this sort of uh, rubric. Oh, and to sum up, we can produce a table from whatever we start, frame, possible frame, three spaces or orthonormal basis from a real Hilbert space. We can rebrick them either by producing a frame by a, a operator A or a possible frame by three spaces or by putting two of them together, phi and I, A, phi and under conditions. For the frame, we need such activity at minus i not in the approximate point spectrum. Similarly to the re spaces where minus i should not in the spectrum of A star. And for passable frames and O and Bs, we also have similar properties. For the rebricking, A should be unitary and self adjoint, as with the orthonormal basis. If we require additional structure like translation invariance or dilation invariance, then of course we have uh, further conditions. Yeah, so this is the references for this talk. We have produced some uh, on papers published, the others are on archive or submitted. This is this uh, nice paper by Dennis Gabor, which I recommend reading because yeah, his, his way of argumenting is really beautiful. And then uh, Ole Christen's <coughs> book on frames and read spaces and here uh, on Hilbert transform and spectral theory. Okay, this is my last slide and I thank you for listening. Thank you.